to this place where we can worship together with our faith family. And a couple of rare announcements, of course, in your bulletin. There are a couple of things that I want to point out to you. With the sharing cover, um, I did open it um, on the last, not last week, the week before, and I was very lonely. <laughs> there was nobody, nobody came in. So uh, I'm going to open it again this Wednesday from 2 to 4. And, uh, and if you know of anyone who could make use of it, um, please um, have, them, have them come in. Um, I'm going to do it every two weeks, uh, every second Wednesday. We are hesitant to advertise. Uh, we think that it's uh, word of mouth. We just need one or two people to come in. And word of mouth will spread. And uh, then we can do what it's there to do. Um, are there other announcements this morning? As many of you are aware, our, this morning our thoughts and... Alice. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yes, uh, Diane Rebel has given us a card, and we're circulating it today for John Steele, who had surgery and uh, is not doing very well just yet, but she uh, will appreciate the card. So we're going to hand the card to her. I'm afraid she signed it as he came in, but uh, don't miss it, okay? Thank you. And as many of you are aware, the, uh, the McDougals um, suffered a great loss this week. Uh, they lost a, a granddaughter, Abby. And so our thoughts and prayers go out to the McDougal's family in this very, very difficult time. There are no other announcements than let us prepare to worship our God.
Our call to worship. Jesus calls us to praise and prayer, to song and silence. Jesus, Jesus calls us to worship. Jesus calls us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus calls us to love. Jesus calls us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Jesus calls us to justice. Let us heed the call of Christ. Let us worship together with joy. Our opening prayer is in unison. Gracious and loving my God, you call to us across deep waters and dark places. Yours is the light which guides us and the voice which we follow. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us as we worship you. May those that have hope be encouraged, those who are sad, cheers, those who are seeking, find you. In the name of your beloved Son, we pray. Amen. Through the babe in Bethlehem, the light of God still shines in our world today. We walk in that light when we seek to serve the love, justice, and freedom of Jesus Christ for all. Thanks be to God. Our first hymn this morning is number 218 from Voices United. We praise you, O God. Star Wars. Uh, not Star Wars, Star Words. The use of Star Words, also called Star Gifts, 
is a prayer practice connected to Epiphany and the New Year that's been growing in popularity in Protestant churches for nearly a decade now. These paper stars are then arranged most commonly face down on the communion table or in a basket, which I have. Typically, participants are encouraged to trust the word they have drawn and not to replace the word. Individuals are often encouraged to place their star word somewhere they will see it regularly throughout the year to allow a consistent reflection on how God has moved through, around, or in connection to that word. Now there are several theological statements being made in this tradition. The Magi followed a star, which ultimately led them to Jesus. Therefore, we too use all the resources we have available to us, including creative prayer practices and intention words for the new year to move closer to Jesus. We trust that God uses multiple ways to guide us and speak to us, and star words are one such lens that might provide us a way to look for God in our midst. We trust that it is often easy to miss God in our daily midst. Having an intention word to consider both in present days as well as to reflect on at the end of the year allows for us to see God in ways we may not have seen God before. We know that the most common prayer practice for many involves speaking to God as opposed to silence or contemplation. And we believe that star words invite a new prayer rhythm of reflection and review that can be a powerful new way to connect with God. And traditionally, by not looking or sorting through the star words at their selection, we practice the spiritual task of receiving. It is not we who are in control in this moment. Instead, we trust that God is present, and we let go of our desire to cultivate or control. And so, this is the basket. These are the star words. Yes, I was a teacher. <laughs> Only took, what, about three hours for you to do that. <laughs> so I would invite you to select a star word on your way out of the sanctuary today to carry with you in the new year. I'll leave the basket at the back for a couple of weeks. Um, so not so you can get a better word. <laughs> because I'll tell you, Rob and I chose our words already. And if I could have chosen a better one for Rob, I would have. His said, speak. Yes. <laughs> Thank goodness mine did not say listen. <laughs> but if there are some people here next week who are not here today, then they too can choose if they wish. Consider the journey of the Magi. They were led by the star which appeared to them. Guided by the stars, we will also journey closer towards Jesus something to ponder. Remind me to take this to the back of the church.
Thank you, Dee. We thank you for your continued support of this church, for your offering, the work of this church in this community, and in the wider church. We will have the dedication of our offerings with the hymn, followed by this prayer. Please remain seated.
first reading is from Isaiah 9, 1 to 4. Isaiah's prophecy recalled seven years of oppression that Israel endured under the Medanites, Abram's descendants. These distant cousins of the Hebrews lived between the Arabian Desert and the Red Sea coast. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of all the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the lands of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you are shattered, the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod to their oppressor. Our second lesson this morning is from the New Testament, Matthew 4, verses 12 to 23. In this reading from Matthew, Jesus begins his Galilean ministry with a simple but urgent call for repentance. He was a familiar message, identical in fact, for sermons given by John the Baptist. When Jesus heard that John had been put to prison, he withdrew in Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, where he was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death a light has dawned. For that time when Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting the net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, said Jesus, and I will out you fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with the father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went out through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among his people. God bless his holy word. Amen. The Spirit speaks and we listen. God, let our hearts be moved. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Before the handy invention of caller ID, I would not hesitate to say that I'm probably not the only person in this room who didn't much like being contacted by telemarketers. Now, I, I didn't blame the telemarketers themselves. I mean, everyone needs a job. And they were just doing theirs. So I really did try not to be too rude. And I was refusing whatever they were selling. It was the big companies that planned such marketing strategies that annoyed me. And sometimes I would politely ask the caller to pass on that feedback, that I had a policy of not buying any product that was promoted to me through unsolicited phone calls. 
Now I understood that these companies had a need to fish for new customers, but I didn't like the feeling of being treated like the fish when they passed their drag nets out. And for that reason, I squirm a little un uncomfortably when I hear Jesus in today's Gospel reading talk about calling us to follow him and becoming those who fish for people. Now true, he only said those words to two fishermen named Simon and Andrew. But the story is related by the Gospel writer in such a way as to imply that it is the model for all disciples and that includes us. But if I'm also taught by Jesus to treat others the way I would like them to treat me, and I don't like being fished for, what am I to make of this call to allow Jesus to make me into one who fishes for people? I mean, nowadays the term has become so on the nose that with a slightly different spelling, P-H, I-S-H-I-N-G. That word, phishing, has even become synonymous with fraud in the online sales area. So if Jesus is proposing that we should first be, be fished for, and then, when successfully caught, we should become those who fish for other people, isn't he the same as a telemarketer? Is there any way we can hear this now that might be good news? Well, I guess the first question is, what is the message? And I'm not about to argue that the ends justify the means, because the argument underpins much of the world's unethical behavior. But the question is still important in understanding what it is that Jesus is talking about when he asks us to become fishers of people. Actually, it may be very important. Jesus' message is summed up in this reading as repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. I think that repenting is not so much about what you turn away from as what you turn toward. Jesus is not focused on condemning what we have been doing, but on announcing the emergence of a new kingdom, new culture of heaven. He is announcing the arrival of something that is wonderfully good news and urging us to jump on board. Now one of the reasons that I want to emphasize the importance of that before going any further is that it is such a contrast to the way that many institutions today present the message, and in particular it is a contrast to much of the fishing methods which many of us are so wary of being associated with. But sometimes the message is not something wonderful is coming, jump on board, but rather a terrible punishment is coming if you don't do as you're told. But Jesus doesn't threaten anyone. Jesus' message is not all about avoiding punishments, but about embracing a new culture, a new life, and being liberated to live life to its fullest. So why have we, yes, sometimes in churches, so often mutated the message into a threat of fire? Perhaps because we've lost sight of what it means to embrace the culture of heaven. When we reduce our understanding of following Jesus to little more than being good citizens and behaving nicely and respectively, then it's difficult to see that the gospel actually has anything much to offer. Life seems pretty much okay as it is, as long as we behave and do the right thing, and so we can no longer really promote the gospel positively as making a big difference. And if we can't attract people into it, we're reduced to trying to scare them into it by making out that there will be fearful consequences for failing to sign up. Salvation becomes merely being allowed to keep the life you already have without being punished at the end, instead of embracing an exciting and wonderful new life. And it is then in danger of being further distorted into a cruel tribalism, where it is just about whether you belong to this tribe or that tribe, and it becomes competitive. 
Then we are just fishing because we want more people on our side, which is another attitude that Jesus never seemed to exhibit. Now, although I said that repenting is more about what you're turning to, what you are leaving behind is not irrelevant. And it is clearly spoken of in the first half of our reading from Matthew, with a quote from the prophet Isaiah, which we also heard in its original setting. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. We are called to turn towards the great light and to embrace the light. But our former situation is described as being in darkness and in the shadow of death. And you might think that if that's what people are living in, then they wouldn't need much fishing. They'd be jumping at the chance to escape the darkness and the shadow of death. So how come they're not? What looks so naturally attractive to us doesn't always appear to be attracting many others. I wonder why. Perhaps it is when the gospel has been reduced to just a cleaned up version of normal. You don't know what's wrong with what you've got if you haven't seen an alternative. So just like people who have grown up under the shadow of death in war zones or extreme poverty, what you presently live with doesn't seem so bad to you because it's normal. The feeling that I'm doing okay is always relative and can only be experienced in relation to what you witness others do. And so many, many people are quite incapable of recognizing the darkness for what it is until they have first experienced the light. Well, in whatever sense we are to be fishing for people, our fishing is aimed at leading people out of the darkness into light in the light. But if we are following the example of Jesus, we won't be doing that by going around pouring scorn on people's present lives or trying to shock them or scare them into repentance. What is it? Well, Jesus doesn't seem to be trying to, to scare anyone or coerce or manipulate or trick anyone into repentance. He does very openly and invitingly live and speak about the new culture of the kingdom of heaven. He is very open in his practice of its values, of non-judgmental acceptance, self-giving love, and generous forgiveness. And as the final verse of our reading made clear, people were experiencing healing in his loving and forgiving presence. When you experience real healing, you realize perhaps how unwell you were before. When you experience generous, unconditional love, you realize how starved of it you were before. And when you experience radical mercy, you realize how relentlessly score-keeping and score-settling the darkness you were living in before was. And of course, without the lived reality, the words are meaningless, but Jesus, uh, Jesus is the real deal. And so people are soon drawn to him like moss to a flame, wanting to get on board this new culture that is emerging at his touch. Now, I don't know if you've ever been fishing for shrimp or prawns. I haven't, but Google to the rescue. Apparently, one way to fish for these crustaceans involves shining a bright light into the water, and they are drawn to the light a bit like moths to a flame. Maybe Jesus meant to tell us to shrimp or prawn for people, Okay, well, that's a bad analogy, but I stressed it a little bit. But the primary call is clearly to live as Jesus lives and to shine our light into the darkness the way he did. 
So it does not mean carefully crafted marketing campaigns. It does not mean slick techniques in seal the deal evangelism. It means living the new culture of the kingdom openly and humbly and graciously. And although this might be the tough part, talking about it openly and naturally, just as we would about any other aspect of our lives. Don't hide your light under a bucket if you go prawning. And don't hide it in the living of your life either. Don't hide it, but don't try to pretend it is something other than what it is either. Don't make the mistake of thinking it is all up to you. Let's note that Jesus did not say that you have to go and make yourselves into fishers of people. He said he would do. He would, will make you fish for people. So allow Jesus to transform you into his image, filling you to overflowing with love and forgiveness and joy and gracious humility, that you will find yourself successfully drawing others towards the light for the light will be shining through you. So don't worry about it. You are not called to be religious telemarketers. Just allow the light of Jesus to fill you up and shine through you. So, fishing anyone? Amen. remain seated and we'll sing send your Holy Spirit there's only one verse isn't there? Yes. Again. We'll sing it through one as preparation for prayer. Number 307. Consider themselves inadequate 
and dismiss or avoid your calling in their lives. Give them a new vision, a vision in which you are their strength and their hope. We pray for those who, in answering your call, must leave the known for the unknown, the oasis for the desert, the uncomfortable for the uncertain. Grant them courage and steadfast faith. We pray today, too, Lord, for those in want and need, and for those of us and of the larger community who suffer in body or in soul. Loving Father, bless us all with an abundant faith, a fruitful ministry, a joyful life. Bless us and all those who gather together to continue the work of Jesus, who came to heal, save, and deliver us all. And our closing hymn this morning is 679 from Voices United, Let There Be Light.